Okay, if I can um, call the meeting to order, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 16th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. We have one item on our agenda today, which is consideration of a number of continued petitions. The first petition is Petition 1603 by Mary Campbell-Jack and Douglas Beattie on behalf of Quakers in Scotland and Forces Watch. Members will recall that the committee published its report earlier in the year, and the Scottish Government responded to the report just before the summer recess. The petitioners have commented on the response, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Angus. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Convener. Um, I think, uh, given the, the petitioner's request for, for uh, more detail regarding the Scottish Government's time frame um, from the uh, Deputy First Minister, uh, <clears throat> you know, given the, the, the ongoing consideration of, of using the principles of, of the Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment, um, I think clearly um, I would agree with the petitioners that we we need to get further clarification from from the Deputy First Minister with regard to the timeline uh, and how they're going to um, use the, the uh, Child Rights and Wellbeing Impact Assessment to, to ascertain uh, the impact uh, in, in schools. Okay. People agree that we should contact the Scottish Government in that way. Is there anything else? No. No, in that case, we can um, agree that action and thank the petitioners for their continued interest in the progress of the petition. The next petition for consideration is Petition 1616 on parking legislation by John S. Shaw. At our last consideration of this petition in March, we agreed to defer consideration until the findings of the Improving Parking in Scotland consultation were published. The consultation is now concluded, which informed the Transport Scotland Bill introduced to this panel in June. Members may wish to note that Chapter 4 of the Bill is focused on pavement and double parking. However, it is unclear from the Bill whether it will be an offence to park in front of a dropped kerb. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, as the lead committee for the Bill, is currently considering Stage 1 of the legislation. It held an evidence session on parking aspects of the Bill at its meeting yesterday and intends to hold an evidence session with the Cabinet Session for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity later this month. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, I, I actually had a, a, a constituency issue around this, about, about um, uh, people parking in front of a, a driveway, a dropped, a dropped car, uh, driveway, and it seems that the law states that, that it is illegal if something's parked in the driveway at the time, but if they're not, you can park in front of a, a, a dropped a dropped curb. That's the information I'm getting back, so, uh, which, which, which surprised me somewhat. Um, so I think maybe uh, it would be right to the Scottish Government to, to just to update us on the progress they're making. I know they're working with the Law Society on this. I think uh, it would be helpful, perhaps, to, to hear back from them there. I certainly think I mean, I've had issues locally about people parking across people's driveways and being told that's not a fence because it's a public highway. So there's lots of contentious issues around that, but the idea of the dropped um, pavement or indeed parking on pavements on is really about um, for people who maybe have got mobility issues, you know, people who've got visual impairments or a wheelchair or a pram. I think there are big issues here. I just wonder whether um, it would be as effective to ask the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee this forward, because they're taking the context of a bill which could then be improved um, if, you know, if we, if we sent a petition to them and said we think this is actually a question that should be addressed during, during the progress of the bill. I would imagine it must be something um, that would be within the remit of, the, of any member to put down amendments to the bill, but maybe Angus could let us know about that. Uh, I'm not on that committee. Oh, you're not? No, it's the other one. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> the other one with a long title. <laughs> I would agree with that. We're holding an evidence session and looking at um, those parts of the bill um, we could ask them to look at this petition in particular. David? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it's not that um, not simply that they're having an evidence session. I think we would want to underline the fact they're actually taking the, um, they're dealing with a bill within that this would sit within the remit of that, that bill. The bill itself is actually looking at parking and so on. So we could perhaps emphasise to the, the committee that we believe there is an issue here. 
um, that the petitioner has highlighted, and we do think it should be something that should be actively considered in the, um, as the bill itself has progressed. So, if that's agreed, we would be closing the petition but referring it to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee um, and emphasising to them that we believe this should be seen in the context of the, the bill itself, which is addressing issues about parking. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay, thank you for that. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1631 by Maureen McVeigh on child welfare hearings. As members will recall, at our last consideration of this petition, the committee noted that the Lord President had the power to determine that family cases be heard by specialist family sheriffs. We therefore agreed to write to the Lord President to establish whether criterion exists to determine when and in what co child contact cases this happens. The Lord President's response is included in our meetings papers. We also agreed to write to the Scottish Government to seek its views in relation to suggestion made by the Scottish Child Law Centre to use child welfare hearing decision notes to record discussions at child welfare hearings. The Government's response references two public consultations it considers relevant to the issues raised in the petition. The first was the Scottish Civil Justice Council consultation on the case management of family and civil partnership actions in the Sheriff Court and a Scottish Government consultation on a review of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 and on a proposed family justice modernisation strategy. These consultations have now concluded. The Government submission went on to state that it intends to, quote, to see what consultees say in relation to child welfare hearings and then consider policy in this area in the light of these comments. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? the petitioner um, actually agrees with the recommendation by the Scottish Child Law Centres Centre ab about using the child welfare hearing decision notes. Um, I think she believes that that would strike an appropriate note. Or well, perhaps we should write to the Scottish Government to um, specifically about that, but also to get an update um, on the action it does intend to take. Yeah, I mean, I was struck with the fact that the petition does make the point that she has responded to the two consultations. Yeah. So I suppose it's a question for her of whether um, the consultation results in them then taking the action that um, she seeks. I mean, it does feel to me that, you know, I think the, the, what I was quite struck by in the petitioner's comments is the gap between what perhaps the Lord President imagines the system to be like and where it's not working like that as a problem. So if you've got different sheriffs and having to rehear, not necessarily getting the full story because there's not a full record of what was dis discussed, and, but you can see the challenge of having a full note and so on. So I think she seems to think there's a balance there. Perhaps we should ask the Scottish Government, um, you know, what its response to that would be. Agreed. Is that agreed? agreed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we would be writing to the Scottish Government to seek an update on the action it tends to take relevant to the petition um, in response to the outcome of the public consultations run by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Civil Justice Council, and perhaps to um, highlight to them that the, that the pet petitioner supports the proposal um, identified by I think, the Scottish Child Law Centre. Is that agreed? Okay. In that case, if we can move <coughs> on. The next continued petition for consideration is Petition 1672 by Hugh Patterson on the Scottish Law Commission report on prescription. At our last consideration of this petition in May, we wrote to the Scottish Government to ask whether it would consider introducing an awareness-raising scheme to inform title deed holders that if they are holding defective property title deeds and that this information does not come to light until 20 years after conveyancing, is the client and not the solicitor insurer that is liable for any costs. The Government's response states it could not justify spending public money on a specific awareness-raising scheme on the 20-year prescriptive period and property transactions. It intends, however, to update the Buying a Home the Legal Process section of its website to inform property owners about prescriptive periods. It is also working with the Law Society for Scotland to update the Society's information on buying and selling a property with regard to the law of prescription. The committee also wrote to Registers of Scotland to ask whether its current IT system was set up in such a way that an automatic letter could be sent to the owner of a property 12 to 18 months before the 20-year cut-off period came into effect to notify them that there would be no right to redress after this period. Registers of Scotland's response states that its current IT system 
Court does not allow them to identify titles that have not changed hands for, say, 19 years, as there has never been any need to do so. The response goes on to say that at significant cost, it would be possible to modify its systems. The submission also states that while it understands the issue raised by the petition, it is extremely rare for people to have defects in their title deeds. The petitioner remains of the view that registers of Scotland should be writing to all proprietors who have owned their titles for 19 years, drawing attention to the law of prescription. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I was certainly um, struck by the comments from registers um, of Scotland that in writing to people, you might create concern, which means they have to go and get advice, um, which will cost money, uh, only to be identified that there's not a, a problem. And I suppose my sense was that that didn't feel proportionate to clearly what has been for a, a problem um, for an individual. But I wonder if people have a view on what we might do. Just to make another comment on that um, as well, because it strikes me that the IT system isn't going to be able to identify those people in order to write. Um, if, if, if I'm looking at the evidence correctly, um, there seems to be sort of uh, uh, a lack of information that would then be able to be used in order to do that. And I think that there is, um, obviously the petitioner um, is, is very well intended um, in, in what he set out to do, but there seems to be quite a lot of barriers to, um, in order to do that. However, there is one kind of uh, light at the end of the tunnel, which is to ask the Scottish Government about the um, what, what the online guidance, the update with regard um, to the um, information on buying and selling properties, and that they could actually provide. Yeah, I mean, I think that the issue about the IT system, you can do anything with an IT system. <laughs> But if you're going to write to every single person whose property is coming up to the 20 year date, I just found that quite a compelling argument. What do people then do when they get that letter? Do they then go and take legal advice if their title deeds are OK or not? Whether the um, and lawyers will know this better than me, that if you are able at the early stage, when, you ident when you're buying a property and you're aware of this because it's on the guidance, you say to your solicitor at that point, I want reassurance from you that you've checked this. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm never quite sure if, you, if somebody, you, know, you live in your property for more than the statutory 20 years, you know, and then further down the line that that, uh, that, that becomes an issue. Um, I suppose the question is whether it's, is there anything that can be done that's proportionate to the risk? And it is about a private transaction. So the context for the, le the legal process is to make sure it's as fair as possible. I, mean, I was quite reassured, I must say, by what the Scottish Government had indicated and the Law Society, they're working together on guidance, and I would hope that would have helped. Question, I, would, I would agree with you, uh, Convener, that the, the, the time to do something about it is at the, at the, the, the purchase. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the, the matters could be raised, it's more appropriate to raise it then than at the 20 year mark. So, yeah, yes, people should be informed and be thinking yeah. about that. Yeah. The question is whether, even with all of that, there is a mistake, and don't spot it till 20 years on. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's a balance of judgment to be made, isn't there, in terms of that? Um, I mean, there is a proposal to write the Scottish Government to seek an update. I think that's been suggested by Rachel. Would people be agreeable to that? Okay. Yeah, is there anything else we should be doing? Because. It, they say it's unusual that this happens, but I've had actually had a couple of constituency cases about um, problems with title deeds that people haven't identified by the time they actually get to selling the property. So I think it is really, really important as a responsibility that lies there um, with um, you know the, the the legal profession. Okay, so we're agreeing to write Scottish Government to seek an update on the progress made in updating its online guidance and its work with the Law Society of Scotland to update information in buying and selling a property. If we can then move on to the next petition. The next petition for consideration is petition 1685 by Jim Nisbet on log burner stoves in smoke control areas. <coughs> the clerk's note refers to the two recommendations in the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's report. That's your committee, yes. excellent, on air quality in Scotland. <laughs> Those recommendations were to undertake more research to understand the extent of pollutants emanating from wood-burning stoves and to review the current regulations and guidance on wood-burning stoves to ensure that the regulations 
are sufficiently robust. The Cabinet Secretary accepted these recommendations and confirmed that these issues are under active consideration jointly with other UK administrations. Steps taken include an investigation of the general public's use of wood burning stoves, which the Cabinet Secretary stated would quote, provide a sound evidence base for reviewing current policy and legislation and any other research requirements. As yet, it does not appear that any findings from the investigation have been published. The petitioner has expressed his disappointment with a clear air for Scotland's strategy and argues that it has already been significant research undertaken on this issue. I no wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. The clerk's note has suggested closing the petition as the government is actively taking forward the recommendations of the ECCLR committee. But I wonder if maybe Angus, you want to comment first? Okay, thanks, um, Camilla. Yeah, the Eclair Committee's uh, report on air quality in Scotland did note at the time, uh, last February, um, the concerns that had been expressed about the potential impact on air quality in Scotland of uh, wood burning stoves. Uh, and as you've you've already mentioned, the, the Cabinet Secretary has already recognised that, um, that the Clean Air Act of 1993 might need to be updated. Um, however, there are new EU standards uh, coming in in 2020, um, which presumably will be signed up to, um, which will effectively force consumers to purchase uh, what they're calling eco-design ready stoves. Um, so there is quite a bit of uh, movement in that uh, area already, but there was a development yesterday um, when the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Environment announced an independent review of Clean Air for Scotland, which is to be chaired by Professor Campbell Gemmell, um, which was a programme for government commitment. So I I'm just wondering if it might be worth us uh, making Professor Gemmell, uh, or at least the steering group, aware of this petition so that it could perhaps be considered uh, while they consider the, the content of the review mm -hmm. uh, of the um, Clean Air for Scotland review. And do you think that would we could do that and close the petition? Or would... Yeah, I think uh, given that there's been quite a bit of movement on this already, um, I think uh, the petitioners made this point. Uh, it's definitely on the government's radar, um, but I think we need to make sure that it's on the the radar of the review of Clean Air for Scotland, um, and by writing to Professor uh, uh, Campbell Gemmell, um, I think we would do that. Okay. Are there any other views, or is that agreed? Okay. So, on that basis, we're agreeing to close the petition, or understanding Order Rule 15.7, on the basis Scottish Government is acting on the um, ECCLR Committee's recommendations, but we're also agreeing to write to Professor Campbell Gemmell, who is obviously going to be conducting the work that you've identified. We think the issues in there are important, and we do note that there has been movement and progress. And we'd want to thank the petitioner um, for petitioning the committee and highlighting these issues. If we can now move on then to um, the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1690 by Emma Shorter on behalf of ME Action in Scotland on the treatment of people with ME in Scotland. Members will recall that we previously took evidence in this petition from the petitioner and agreed to write to a range of stakeholders, including the Scottish Government and health boards. The clerk's note provides a summary of the submissions received from health boards, which appear to justify the concerns expressed by the petitioner in her petition and in her previous oral evidence about an inconsistency of approach or awareness across health boards. We also have received submissions from individuals outlining their experiences in particular with regard to cognitive behavioural therapy and graded exercise therapy. These appear to be supported by stakeholders including Science for ME and Action for ME. In response, NHS Education for Scotland refers to a learning matrix it has produced which considers cognitive behavioural therapy quote, has the clearest evidence of benefit. The Scottish Government acknowledges that CBT can result in some people feeling worse, but notes that studies have found it does have benefits for others. On our tables, we also have copies of written submissions that were not included within our meetings pack, as they are in the process of being published. Invest in ME research sets out its position why it believes greater funding is required for biomedical research into ME. It also considers that the delivery of training and education requires to be overseen by experienced clinicians and suggests that claims of the efficacy of CBD, CBT sorry, are misleading. 
Stuart Brown seeks clarification on the Scottish Government's submission, particularly with regard to the actual government spend within the £90,000 of funding it recently announced for research in this area. He also raises concerns about the Scottish Government's reference to the £2.5 million pounds it invests in specialist nursing and care, and argues that this money was not spent on ME, nor did the Government particularly intend it to be. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I think I'm quite struck by, again, the number of responses and the powerful arguments um, that are being put forward. I was also found that um, the um, evidence from the professor, uh, if I can remember his name, um, Professor Jonathan Edwards, which, you know, I just thought that his argument about why there was, and I don't pretend to understand these, and we're not clinicians, and so we always are, are anxious about intervening in what are clinical matters and with people who have got expertise, but his explanation of why he would build in bias um, around behavioural um, issues, I thought was really very interesting, and the pattern of experience by those who have um, given submissions I thought was also significant. Brian? Um, as you know, convening in this place every day is a school day, and uh, there was a debate uh, on, on ME within uh, when the panel, which, uh, um, which I took part in. I'm not sure who else was involved in that, but I was really struck at that time. I mean, I, I, to be honest, I wasn't uh, well versed in it, and the number of submissions that we received prior to that debate uh, was was um, significantly higher than most. So. It certainly brought it much more to my attention, and it's an issue that I, I, I think that uh, needs to be needs to be looked at further. And I was also struck by, in those submissions, the difference of approach across across, across different different health boards. Um, and again, that we, we all, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but that whole postcode lottery of the way in which um, health boards approach this. So, I think it's something we should look at. I'd be quite interested to hear from um, probably the Cabinet Secretary on this. Um, I think that's probably the next logical step that we should take here. Because um, in terms of the Cabinet Secretary coming, we could talk about the range of experiences that have been identified, the different practice by different health boards, but also what seems to be a, a contradiction in terms of the clinical arguments, which are some people saying, well, yeah, it's not very good for some people, but it's, it's good for others. Well, I think the professor kind of makes the point that the way in which it's assessed builds in some of that, which is problematic. Rachel? I think you've hit the nail on the head there because um, I, I was very um, uh, gladdened to see that my own um, uh, NHS board had, had made a submission. And I was quite disappointed, to be quite honest, that you know only a handful um, of NH boards had responded to this. Um, what was evident, and which you've just highlighted, is that there's such a different approach um, from boards, um, and they, they look at things differently. And my own health board, um, for example, looks at um, CBT and um, graded exercise therapy as evidence-based and, and follows the um, Scottish Government guidelines. And, you know, it, that wasn't noted in some of the other NHS boards, but um, as we know, the uh, petitioner hasn't responded to... Um, the the submissions so far, so it would be as as it says the petitioner has yet to respond to these submissions. Is that correct? That's another petitioner. There, there is quite oh. a detailed response. It, oh, is there? And one of the other things in the evidence that really struck me, and I suppose I would need to get some clarification, is this table where they've identified the recommendations yeah. to government. Yeah. And there's just not implemented, not implemented not known, not implemented all the way through. And I think, you know, almost that's, that conversation is easier probably directly with the Cabinet Secretary okay. rather than um, in dialogue. But no, there's, there's quite detailed um, comments on really on, on, on all the other submissions. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, you and, and uh, Rachel Hamilton have raised the, the issue of different approaches by health boards, and, and it's clear from, from the submissions that we've received from... Uh, from the health boards, that the approach to training and awareness varies uh, quite a bit. Uh, there's also a mixed approach to uh, CBT and uh, GET, and there's a mixed approach to provision of treatment and support. So, <clears throat> for example, NHS Lorien have their MECFS rehabilitation service at the Astley 
uh, Ainsley Hospital, whereas NHS and Fries and Galloway state that the thrust of their service provision is community-based. So, so it, it is mixed out there, and it would be good to maybe get um, the views of the other health boards that haven't responded. Um, you know, I would have thought on an issue such as this, they would all have been keen to to uh, submit um, their, their views. Uh, and just on the uh, NHS uh, De Fries and Galloway uh, issue, I know that um, my colleague Emma Harper, uh, MSP for the South of Scotland region, has been very active in addressing issues uh, related to ME in her area. Uh, she's contacted NHS De Fries and Galloway and GPs and other local services and health professionals, as well as attending events in Dumfries. Um, now, Emma Harper can't attend today's meeting, but she is aware that the petition is on the agenda today, uh, and I know that she's working towards uh, better health board uh, engagement and proper evidence uh, for best treatment and support options. Now, uh, <clears throat> in the briefing that we received, um, I was quite concerned to note um, that um, a survey conducted by Action for ME of, of GPs found that 82% of those surveyed, uh, surveyed had, had not undertaken any training on ME whatsoever. Uh, and a, uh, what I would class as a staggering 66% were not aware of the good practice, <coughs> good practice statement. So I do think we need to get the Cabinet Secretary in to, to get her view on the, the provision of services uh, to ME sufferers, um, particularly as the conveners pointed out, a number of recommendations haven't been picked up. And I said, what was I was. I mean, I um, remember when people first started talking about ME as a younger woman, and um, there was at that time a scepticism, and that comes out quite strongly from the evidence that people are basically told, well, not quite. You're imagining it, but you have to you have to deal with it psychologically, as opposed to recognising, as some of the clinicians here are now identifying, this is a um, this is a condition which is a you know. I think they're talking about biomedical research they're talking about. So, again, I, I you know, don't pretend to be an expert, but I'm quite struck that, that that's a thread in it. And that's, that seems to create... That comes out, I think, from some of the evidence where they're... And, and what they're... And I, is, I suppose the question to ask the Cabinet Secretary, are health board responses informed... Or, you know, the provision informed by that thinking still? And to what extent do the, do the Scottish Government recognise that that's um, a problem? <clears throat> Yep. Would it be to um, ask the, the NHS boards that didn't um, submit, as Angus has suggested, again um, prior to seeing the Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, you know, we should obviously invite the Cabinet Secretary and in doing so send out a note again to the Health Board saying that we're going to be um, ha having a session with the Cabinet Secretary. It would be helpful to get a fuller picture of what's happening across the country. That may, perhaps that might... Um, I mean, it may be that it's something in some health board areas it's, it's simply not given any priority, but that's a story in itself or an issue in itself that we would need to address. So, with your agreement, um, we plan then to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport to give evidence at a future meeting and that we um, contact the health boards that have not um, submitted in order to have an opportunity to do so ahead of that. Um, meeting, and we would also want to record a thanks to those health boards that actually did um, provide um, a response. So, if that's agreed, we can move on to the next petition, which is Petition 1691 by Christopher Hampton on behalf of the steering group of Bowman's View and calls for a view of the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003. The committee previously sought views from the Scottish Government, the Law Society of Scotland, and the Scottish Law Commission. The clerk's note summarises the responses received and notes that the Scottish Government has no current plans to consult on changing the law in this area. For our further consideration, it might be helpful to have a response from the petitioner to get his views and submissions received to date, and, and, and that's the one that we've not um, received thus far, Rachel. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. Brian? This is the second thing I think we should be... Uh inviting the petitioner to, to respond. I think that, uh, until that time, um, I, I think that uh, what we do with this petition uh, you know, would be put on hold. I think we're interested in the issues around here and we recognise that they are complex and it might just simply be helpful to get the view of the petitioner in terms of what we, um, we might do next, although clearly it would seem from the Scottish Government's point of view that it's, it's not their intention to do as the 
the petitioner request. We think that would be helpful to give the petitioner that opportunity. Is that agreed? Yes. Okay. In that case, if we could move on then to petition 1692, which was submitted by Leslie Scott and Alison Proust on behalf of Times Trust and Scottish Homes Education Forum. At our first consideration of this petition, we took evidence from the petitioners and agreed to write to the Scottish Government and the Information Commissioner's Office. The Information Commissioner's Office offers no comment on the call for an inquiry, but sets out its role and views on the data protection aspect of the action called for in the petition. The Scottish Government does not agree with the petitioner's call for an independent inquiry. The petitioners argue that by stating that it is a matter for local authorities as to how they deliver the GIRFEC policy and framework, the Scottish Government is abdicating its responsibility. Committee members may be aware that there is a significant interest in this petition among some individuals who may have contacted us directly. Members may also wish to note that the clerks have received correspondence from individuals other than the petitioners explaining their concerns about the information sharing aspect. As members are aware, submissions can only be published as and when they meet the Parliament's criteria to do so. For example, they should not refer to ongoing cases or disputes. And I am aware that the clerks have been reviewing submissions that have been received recently, and these will be published in due course. As far as our consideration of the petition is concerned, members have before them a copy of correspondence from the petitioners expressing their concern that some submissions are not being published. The petitioners have offered some suggestions of their own for what action we may wish to take on this petition. These include, for example, insisting that their points are properly addressed by the Scottish Government. They also suggest that human rights infringements in the context of upholding children and families' rights could be explored by bodies such as the Children's Commissioner, the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Human Rights Commissioner. In that context, I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, convener, um, I mean, I, I, it is, I mean, this particular petition it is, um, I'm sure you, you, every, every member's the same, an un, unusual, uh, really large amount of submissions and lobbying uh, of, of uh, to all to all of the, the members on the panel. I think, uh, from my own perspective, I think this seems to be, there is a, there seems to be a confusion of approach, in my opinion, around uh, uh, for a number of councils. I'm aware that the Education and Skills uh, Committee are currently uh, working on something similar to this. It would seem to me that um, we would be able to uh, invite them to, uh, or at least write to them in terms of the, the petition that's come into us, uh, to add to their investigation mm -hmm. in, that, in that respect, because they're doing quite a bit of work on this. Well, to be clear, what the Education and Skills Committee has done is it has declined to produce a stage one report until we know that there's a code of practice in place. Um, and that's because we were not satisfied. The bill was predicated on the code of practice. And as a committee, we took the view that it was, wasn't possible to produce a stage one report until you knew what that said. And I think that work is ongoing. But um, what the Education Skills Committee obviously is looking at is the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill which has been drafted as a consequence of the judgment in the courts about the current position. So um, in a, it is addressing a lot of the concerns that have been identified. I just wonder whether well, we do know it's not that the GIRFEC process um, is not being debated in the parliament. It's been, it's been arguments argued through in the, in, the, in the education committee, but obviously in, in the full uh, parliament itself. I just wonder whether um, some of the suggestions offered by the petitioners around um, the Children's Commission, the Quality and Human Rights Commission, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, might be the most appropriate way for the petitioners to go, rather than for it, you know, for a, an independent review to be called for by this committee to um, the government. Um, and we could, we could perhaps um, um, allow the, the petitioners to explore raising concerns with the bodies they have identified. Um, in their most recent email? I think that um, I, I'm struggling to, to work out what we could do further than what the, the Education Skills Committee are doing. That's, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's obviously um, an issue that is, is raising uh, a lot of concern. Um, and, uh, and obviously we have to take cognizance and recognize that, but I, I'm just struggling to see what more the Petitions Committee can do 
over and above what the Education Skills Committee can do, other than perhaps uh, send what we have here to the Education and Skills Committee? To be clear, in all the years I've been in the Parliament, I don't recall a committee declining the responsibility of writing a Stage 1 report on a piece of legislation. And critically, this legislation is in response to concerns about the policy, which were identified in court. So that is entirely included in this issue about what has happened around um, named person. I just, so I, 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 you know, I would be, um, I recognise there's a very strong argument for referring it to the Education Skills Committee to ask them to look at this in the context of what we are doing around the bill which is in response to the problem with the, the policy in the first place. Um, the question is whether, um, I mean, if people are agreed to that, I don't know, I'd be interested in the uh, views of, of other members. I don't know, Angus, if you've got a view. Yeah, <coughs> I think that's that's the way forward, Camina. But just for clarification, can we get some advice if it is forwarded to the um, Education and Skills Committee? Um, would they then have the, op the option uh, to forward it to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee or, or the Justice Committee. I think the suggestion is that the, that is a route the petitioners may consider, yeah. and we might argue that we we can see the force of that argument in them in that them doing that. that the, and I think that's the way you know that it might it would be done. It wouldn't be for this committee to do that. I don't think. Can I just uh, clarify that if we don't uh, refer it um, to the Equality in, in human rights on the human rights basis, um, the petitioner can request that. If we've given it to the Education Committee, what happens at that point? Well, you know, we can maybe get some clarification. My understanding would be, and we would need to check in terms of giving advice to petitioners, it is not that the petition. Would be sent, but the issues that have been identified in the petition would be something that presumably you can make a request to, the, to these bodies to, to explore. Um, I know that some of them, are, or I understand that some of them have, will have been involved in some of the discussion around the implications of the name person policy in, in, in any event because it was a matter of, of discussion in the courts. So the question for us as a petitions committee in terms of dealing with the petition as opposed to the issues that have brought the petition here is do we want to um, refer the petition to the Education Skills Committee to inform their work you know, in highlighting these issues, the data protection issues, um, as part of the scrutiny of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill, which, as I've said already, is a bill that is there because court, at a court level they've confirmed that there was issues around the policy. Um, and I suppose the separate question is whether we would want to say to the petitioners, you may want to seek... Um, advice about how that engagement with the bodies that they have identified um, could be taken forward. I, think I, 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 I agree, uh, convener, that, that, that that's uh, probably the positive way forward. I mean, it does, it's, not a, it's not a case that we're trying to pass this on to something. I, I think it's a, 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 a situation in a, uh, that's been identified as being you know, um, of grave concern, but I think it's best served. Uh, in the work that's done within the Education and Skills Committee. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I think the thing I would want to underline is that this is not an issue that the Parliament has not addressed and will not will have to address again. I mean, the, the yeah. Scottish Government will have a responsibility to come back to the Education Skills Committee. <laughs> it wants its bill to go through. The committee is saying, um, and not unanimously, I would have to say, but it, the committee um, has agreed not to produce a stage one report on the bill that the government wants on its policy to address the weaknesses that were identified in the court. So it's, it is a very live issue in the parliament. Um, the separate question about the human rights dimension as identified in the petition, um, I think we would we'd perhaps want to give advice to petitioners about how that might be taken forward. Um, and of course, the petitioners always have the the right to return with a further petition if they felt that that wasn't something that was satisfying um, their concerns. I mean, I don't think anybody in here wants to um, dismiss those concerns that have come that have driven the petition because clearly it's a policy area that the Parliament's wrestled with um, over time. So can I take it that we are agreeing to refer the petition to the Education Skills Committee? Um, 
to, to allow them to look at the consideration of the data protection issues raised in the petition to be included when the committee resumes its scrutiny of the bill, um, but that we would also identify for the petitioners what other options there are in terms of specifically the human rights issues. Is that agreed? agreed. Okay. In that case, if we can move on to the last petition for consideration today, which is petition 1695 by Ben and Evelyn Mundell on access to justice in Scotland. Can I welcome David Stewart, MSP, and Edward Mountain, MSP, for consideration of this petition. The petition is linked to EU milk quotas. In the UK, farmers were permitted to trade their quotas. However, in a small number of ring-fenced Scottish areas, free trade in quotas was not permitted. The petitioners argue that, quote, the ring fence put an enormous burden on any dairy farmer in the southern isles of Scotland um, who was either having to give up production or cut back production. The petition is focused on access to legal advice and support on human rights law rather than the human rights impact of the ring fencing policy itself. The committee first considered the petition on 7 June when it agreed to write to the Scottish Government, the Law Society of Scotland, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership. Responses have now been received and the petitioner has responded to these. And I wonder if it might help our consideration to ask David and Edward if they want to say something um, before we conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I can thank the uh, committee for allowing me to come along to give some background information about the family. Um, you'll know, Convener, that I'm a, a strong supporter of the Petitions Committee and I'm glad to see there's a couple of survivors from, from my area uh, still here and welcome them, them both. Uh, you'll know that I've already given um, some evidence to the committee before and in a previous um, iteration I also gave evidence uh, I think in the previous session um, so perhaps I can give some background uh, so I've been involved with the family for several years and I'd also like to thank uh, previous M MSPs who support the family not least uh, Jimmy McGregor and Peter Peacock and obviously I'd like to thank Edward Mountain also for, for his work and I welcome the Mindell family to, to the gallery um, as I said last time convener this is a highly complicated case but I think it's well summarised in the papers that you'd have received. So on the surface, it's about the ring fencing of dairy farmers' milk quotas, particularly but not exclusively within the Southern Isles ring fenced area. But the fundamental question to me is how an ordinary Scottish family on a modest income can seek redress and remedy for potential breaches of the European Convention on Human Rights and injustice in general. Well, the simple answer is that, of course, they should seek legal representation through the civil legal aid scheme. Now, you will know, convener, the family has been in touch with more than 50 lawyers, either in person or by phone, but the vast majority will not deal with human rights cases. Those who will have said that they will only deal with prisoners or people who have immigration uh, issues. One lawyer who agreed to take up the case wanted £25,000 in upfront payment before proceeding. Now, that payment at the time represented double the family's disposable yearly income. So Mr. and Mrs. Medell uh, tell me that many farmers in the ring fence days were placed in an impossible situation uh, with a milk price below the cost of production. That led to the forfeit of their property, uh, and as outlined in the papers uh, that you have, that is a breach of Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So farmers in that position had no money to pay interest on overdraft and had to incinerate perfectly healthy uh, cows at less than £500 per head. They had no money to diversify, suffered severe stress, and in some cases lost their home and business. So I would stress this is not just about one family, um, much as the Medells are in a terrible, tragic position. It's about how you right or wrong. And as I said last time I, I appeared before you, surely the test of any advanced democratic society is how easily and transparently you can seek legal redress at the highest level. I'll conclude, because I know time is uh, short, in five very quick points. Um, the family believe there has been a major miscarriage of justice both for themselves and for their neighbours and the wider area, which I would support. Um, I do believe, and I, I, I do accept you don't have a particular remit over this, but I do believe that the remit of the Scottish Human Rights Commission should be altered and expanded to allow them to assist in cases where people have found it impossible to access the services of a lawyer in respect of human rights. This is very much what happens with the Northern Irish Human Rights Commissioner. And I also believe the cases should be investigated, perhaps in conjunction with the university. Again, this happens in Northern Ireland. And I do believe it would be a good educational point of view, as well as assisting the individuals uh, in justice. Um, could I quote Judith Robertson um, from the Scottish Human Rights Commission, 
who I think appeared before the House of Lords on the 2nd of May. And um, if I just quote what she said, the cheapest way to ensure that rights are delivered is to ensure that they're not breached in the first place. And she went on to say, it's difficult to allow, it's difficult for anyone to take a case in Scotland. We have no power to support Henry to do that. In fact, we're expressly disallowed. And finally, um, I, I thank the committee for listening to my representations. I appreciate the issue is very complicated, but I stress the key issue is access to human rights and legal advice at a very senior level for families that have limited funding. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Edward Mountain. Convener, I, I would like to echo what David Stewart has said about uh, I thank you and the committee for, for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you. Uh, before I go any further, I'd just like to declare that I have an interest in an agricultural business and the comments that I will be making will mainly be on the agricultural side. When it comes to the Mundells, I think the important point to remember is they had about half a million uh, litres of milk quota and in, in a particular year, and we're talking over a, a number of years, you know, milk quota was trading at 28 pence a litre if you wanted to sell it and could be low, leased out at 12 pence a, a litre if you wanted to lease it out. But they were prohibited from doing that because the quota was ring-fenced within an area. Now, that was a decision taken by the Scottish Government to advance and protect another industry. And for that, the Mundells have had to suffer. And they are in the situation that as their business went out uh, and became less profitable, they didn't have the capital that every other dairy farmer in the country, if they wanted to go out of dairy farming, could use to, to, to divert into other enterprises. And that, to me, is a fundamental breach of somebody's human rights, especially if everyone else, apart from the ring fenced area across the United Kingdom, had the ability to trade that quota. Now, I echo the points that David Stewart's made, that it is particularly difficult, and I could wax lyrical for hours on milk quotas and quotas, and, there, and I won't, convener, for which I'm sure you're grateful. But the comment is, is, is that there are not that many legal minds that have a huge detailed knowledge of this, which affects their ability to get that uh, knowledge uh, and use it to defend themselves and others from the situation that they find themselves in. Now, I would like to see the, uh, and if I may, I believe that uh, I've listened to the Scottish, or sorry, I've read the Scottish Governments and the Law Society's uh, comments on this. And, and bearing in mind what, I'm, what, what you've heard and read as a committee, I wonder if uh, once the uh, First Minister's advisory group on human rights leadership, when they publish their recommendations in December this year, we might all be in a position to understand how the Mundells and other farmers can, can resolve the issue. And therefore, I would be minded, and I know it's up to the committee to recommend that we wait to see what that says to find out how the Mundells can pro progress their case, because I seriously believe they've been disadvantaged and their human rights affected. Thank you, convener. Can I maybe ask just a couple of points? Just to be clear what the policy was, what industry were they protecting? It's and, a local... And, and, sorry. sorry, and how, you know, um, not common, but how many other cases have been identified? Not so much which have maybe led to individual circumstances that the family have been led to, but where people um, felt that level of disadvantage. And what is your view, if someone is thinking, you've contacted 50 lawyers and none of them will take on the case, why is that? Is it simply because you think they don't have the expertise or they're not capable of, of getting the expertise? Because I think that's an issue that you know, that I find interesting. Perhaps I'll leave it to Edward to talk about the technicalities of the, the creamery issue. But as far as the legal side is concerned, obviously the Law Society does advertise lawyers across Scotland that have expertise in human rights. And I'm not denying uh, this beast doesn't exist. Of course it does. There's lots of expertise in Scotland. Um, the, pr the problem is, is access to funding for that, um, and as I said, that many uh, lawyers who do have this expertise are specialising uh, in, in two areas, um, as I said, which uh, involves immigration um, being one of them. So it's, it's very difficult for family to access it. Now, the fact is, if you've contacted 50 lawyers and you can't get anyone to, um, you know, to take on your case, as the Americans say, if it waddles and it quacks, it must be a duck. I mean, the problem is there is a real problem accessing justice partly through funding, partly through expertise. Mm -hmm. But if I, I'll, I'll let you in in a moment, but if I were to be devil's advocate and I don't have this view, then may some people think, if you can't get one out of 50 lawyers to take on your cases because there isn't a case. 
No, I don't think we were at that. I don't think I ever got to that stage. Um, basically, in one case, I said it was twenty-five thousand pounds was required before they started. They didn't have okay. access to that. And in the other, the other cases, the contact, the, the family were not in the categories that the lawyers who did human rights were willing to take on. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I'd just echo that. Having, having um, taken legal advice when I was working professionally, it is extraordinarily expensive to get top quality advice, and if there isn't a uh, wide variety of people available to do it, and it's limited down to one person. It means that they have to spend a huge amount of background reading to get up into the situation where they understand the problem. And that would then generate a huge amount of upfront costs. Just as far as ring fencing and quotas concerned, I mean, the ring fencing w was done to ensure that, that a particular creamery w worked um, and could continue business. Now, I'm not aware um, that there was milk quota ring fencing across the rest of the UK. It was a tradable asset, as far as I'm aware. Um, and I, I brought with me, and, and I, you know, for example, you know, a, a company that has got milk prices and have traded it across the United Kingdom, um, and, and they're all available here to see. So you could buy and sell it, but not if it was ring fenced. And the problem is, is that once you ring fence quota uh, to a particular area, to a particular supplier. It, 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 it doesn't take much to work out that the supplier knows that that quota can't move, and therefore they can dictate mm -hmm. the price. And once you get into a situation of a monopoly, then the price is distorted, and it's usually not in the, in the favour of the producer community. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, Angus? <clears throat> thanks, Convener. Just picking up on that, how much was the price distorted, do we know? Um, I, I, I can't give you the exact, the exact figures, but it, it, it was less than other parts of the United Kingdom. Mm. And, and, and we see that, in fairness, we see that now, that, that price, price is reflected and changes. And, and milk price, as you know, at the moment is, is a real issue. I mean, you know, we, farmers are seeing milk being sold in the supermarkets, I think, at about 49 pence a litre. And some people are only getting 21 pence a litre, you know, farmers actually on the doorstep. So there's a huge disparity, and that was reflected then as well. I, mean, I started this, but I guess that the, the petition is not really about that. Is it once you find yourself in a difficulty, um, what, what is there in the system to, to support somebody? Um, I don't know if... I'll take you in a minute, David, Brian. I, mean, I, think, I think there's... There's, there's a number of facets to this, uh, not least of all in, in mean, access to you know, legal representation. You know, in, in itself, uh, is a human right. I mean, I, I, I'm interested, to, you know, of a mind uh, to, to want to ask the Scottish government, you know, its thoughts, process, and, and actually uh, ring fencing this. Because it seems to me that you know, they certainly. I'm, I'm pretty sure that their, their intention wasn't to, to put uh, the Mandels into to this kind of position, um, and it's a, an unintended consequence. Um, but I would certainly be of, of a mind to, to at least ask uh, um, the Scottish Government its thought uh, process in, in, in doing, making the decisions it actually did. So we would, we would contact the Scottish Government to ask them that. I'm quite interested in... I mean, I recall when the Scottish Human Rights Commission was established and it was the reason it didn't have the right to take up cases, in my recollection, was because it wasn't to be in competition with UK-wide body that had those kinds of um, responsibilities. But I wonder sometimes if then at a UK level, I think, well, you've got the Scottish Human Rights Commission, so you don't need um, support at a UK level. And so I think I'd be interested in whether they've they've looked at the, the, the role and remit of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Is it something that they would want to to review, given the kind of arguments there are? It may be that they, they don't. They feel that the, the landscape is sufficiently um, stable that, 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 that these concerns wouldn't arise. I, mean, I think the other question is where... I mean, if you've got the right to legal um, support, the whole debate around legal aid is to what extent it should be means-tested and so on. I think there's an there's an argument around that, but it would be interesting to see what Scottish government's view was. Um, I think I think you know, again, it, it, I think there's two two facets to this. I think the fact is that uh, there just seems to be a very limited access to to legal representation in this particular case, and I'd be certainly looking to to, to investigate that a little bit further. I don't know whether the 
the law society perhaps would have a view on that um, in terms of you know what what we, sh what we should be doing to make sure this uh, yeah, a situation like this doesn't arise again. Mm -hmm. Rachel, well, there's two points. Um, just picking up on what you just said um, about the Scottish Human um, Rights Commission, um, the petitioner um, makes the point that um, perhaps they sh they should receive a higher budget. Um, in order to have a wider remit over enforcement powers. So it, that is something that we should probably be asking the Scottish Government um, about. <coughs> and, and the First Minister's advisory group, um, obviously this was due to government policy, and therefore um, perhaps the human rights should be taken into consideration when creating new policies. Um, and... Um, I'm not sure if um, the First Minister's Advisory Group is aware of this example because it's it's a great example and I think that, that we should actually be putting that into the mix when they're considering um, human rights within that group. I mean, I'm assuming it's got to I know in terms of legislation they have to be human rights compliant and they have to sign off that any proposed legislation is human rights compliant but sometimes then establish in courts that that hasn't that test has not actually been met, but um, I think that so we would be writing to the Scottish Government, um, particularly about the, the remit of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, um, looking at its response to the report on rethinking legal aid, um, and perhaps asking about the First Minister's advisory group as well. Would that be agreed? Yeah. Is there anything further we could be doing, or should be doing? Well, that, that if the human rights were taken into consideration, this wouldn't have happened when that policy was created. So, therefore, you know, is there any evidence that suggests that that test was actually done at the time? Well, I think, to be fair, it would be somebody in court would have to establish that the policy created a human rights deficit. We don't know that, do we? I think that's, that's the argument being made that the problem for the petitioners is was that they weren't even able to get to that point because they couldn't get a lawyer to take the case. So, you know, there, you have dealt with this in others, so not like the circumstance at all, but somebody who wants to take a case forward and just cannot get a lawyer, the Law Society provides a list, but you can't make, currently I don't think you can make a lawyer to take up a case. I think there are, there are issues around that, that they're just a general policy issues which I think are quite interesting. Would there be a case to, to look at taking some sort of oral evidence from the Scottish Government on this, do you think? Yeah. Um, I'm never opposed to having the Scottish Government in front of me taking, and taking <laughs> evidence, but can I suggest that we write to them in the first instance? And because it, you know, there's a number of things that have been asserted here that would be worthwhile finding out. What is their process and policy terms around you know, when they make those kind of decisions? Um, have they reflected on the consequence of that? Have they done any analysis of the consequence of that? And do they have a view on both the role of legal aid, but also this question about the Scottish Human Rights Commission? Can I suggest that we do that in the first instance? Is that agreed? I think they're a reasonably substantial. Vina, and I'm not sure whether, you know, writing to them, it, it might just be that to highlight this in a stronger way, it is better to take evidence directly. Right. Can I suggest what we do is we don't have one blocking the other, but so we don't preclude the possibility of having a minister in front of us, but that we do initially write to them and ask them for their view, and we can then at least interrogate them on what they've said, if that's what we decide to do at a future meeting. David, do you want to come in? Um, I, well, I think the key is the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and we've heard the quote that I gave from uh, Judith Robertson, I think it was in the House of Lords, I mean, the key points that she's made, just to restress that, is uh, the best way to have the rights is to make sure that they're not breached in the, in the first place, but secondly, there must be a easy access to redress, and there, there isn't. And as um, Edward, I think, put very well, in, in very simple terms for those of us that are not farmers or crofters, which eliminates Angus, um, is basically on, on day one, this family had a valuable, valuable asset. When the ring fencing came in, they didn't. Um, so it was, the same, it was the same beast, it was the same milk, but because of the ring fencing, they physically weren't able to take it to the creamery because there was a restriction made because of the way the monopoly operated. So it wasn't suddenly that we had a world decline in milk prices. 
uh, what happened was because they physically could not sell this and they didn't have the transparency because in other parts uh, of the world, parts of the UK, you could transfer and sell your milk across the whole of Britain. But because of the situation where they were, they physically could not do that. So the creamery were not picking up the milk. So that's what caused the, the big problem because of the ring fence. And this led to other families losing their property, which is the argument about the breach of European okay. Convention on Human Rights. But to be clear, the petition was looking at access to support yes. in terms of human rights. So due and to my question is, yeah. you know, the Scottish Human Rights Commission can't do it because there's another body at that responsibility. Does the body at a UK level now not they support petitioners or folk who've got a problem in Scotland, which they might provide elsewhere, in England, for example? You talk about Northern Ireland, but I think there's a very particular reason why the Human Rights Commission in mm -hmm. Northern Ireland is constituted in the way that it was. But in the rest of the United Kingdom, would somebody in these circumstances be in the same position? I guess that's what we would be interested in knowing. Edward? Sorry, just very briefly, if I, if, if I could clarify. Uh, uh, the creamery were picking up the milk, but because they were in a monopoly, they could, they could dictate the price. And I, I, th I think the very issue that, that you're looking at, uh, Kamina, is entirely the right one, is that, that they had heritable property, which, uh, if you own heritable property, can be transferred um, and, and, and moved on, and they were prevented from doing that. Mm -hmm. and, and that, therefore, I, I, I don't see it. And, and if I could just make a, a, an observation, and, and it's not for me to protect the government at the time, but I don't believe the government had any malice or forethought when they did this. I believe this was done in the best possible intentions, but it was an unintended consequences, mm -hmm. and that unintended consequences have breached people's human rights, and, and that is my strong belief. And, and for that, I believe that somebody ought to hold the government mm -hmm. to account. I suppose not to um, prolong the discussion or um, anything like that or to imply that what you've said is, is not true. I'm just confirming again that our concern is not about establishing that case, but that as a consequence of that case it has thrown up something in the system which we want to address, which is in certain circumstances people can't access um, the legal advice around the breach of their human rights, which perhaps some of us imagined they could have done, um, and whether it's the role of the Scottish Human Rights Commission or the responsibility of the UK body or whatever, there's clearly a, a question there. So are we agreeing, as we've already decided, to write the Scottish Government um, in these terms? And when we've got the evidence back, we'll make a decision about whether we should bring the Minister in. Is that agreed? Amen. Okay. In that case, can I thank um, Edward Mountain and David Stewart very much for um, their attendance? Um, I think that has, we have reached the, the last item in our business today. I think we want the opportunity again to thank all those petitioners and those who have um, produced submissions um, as a consequence of the range of petitions we have heard this morning. Um, can I thank everyone for their attendance and I will close the meeting.